Um, so our next uh, speak, our next section of speakers will be the AWG Science Lightning Talks. Um, and then this section, the speakers have five minutes to talk. Speakers, you will hear one ding of a bell and that will be your 30 second warning and three dings of a bell means that your time is up. For the audience, um, I'm gonna kindly ask that you um, wait until, we will wait until the end of this section in order to do a Q&A for all speakers. So I'll kindly ask that um, when you put your questions in conference IO, please add the name of the speaker so I know to whom to address the question. So with that, um, I would like to introduce our next, our first speaker in this section, and that is Andrea Camara from the University of Oslo, and he will be representing the animal AWG. And Andrea, take it away. Hi everyone. So can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, perfect. So it is a great honor for me to be here today and I will present you our project on space flight and frailty. As you can see, we are many people in this group. So uh, there was no space in the slide for taking everyone's picture, but of course I will present on everyone's behalf. So first of all, I'll start introduce you what frailty is. Um, this is a quite novel topic in the clinic, and it is um, a, this term is mostly used in geriatric medicine. So age frailty is an age-associated clinical syndrome that is characterized by a decrease of biological reserve and, most importantly, uh, of the resistance to stressors such as. Um, an acute disease or a surgery, and this due to a functional decline of several physiological systems, such as the immune system, the musculoskeletal one, the, the central nervous system, and so on. And this condition results in an enhanced risk of disability, hospitalization, and death. You have to think that a pretty is uh, considered the most important risk factor for the development of non-catastrophic disability in the elderly. And to date, the assessment of this condition is based mostly on physical parameters such as gait speed, weight loss, grip strength, and declining cognitive function and the presence of multiple diseases. And despite this syndrome being usually regarded as a condition present mostly in the elderly, Clinical studies demonstrated that chronological age uh, is not the only determinant of this condition. Instead, the pathophysiology of frailty seems to be strongly connected to the, bio the biology of aging. And biologically speaking, for instance, a 70 years old patient uh, can potentially be uh, more aged than an 80 years old or 80 years old one. Um, and as you can see on this slide, there are many processes that are involved in, uh, in the development of aging, such as DNA damage, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, oxidative stress, and uh, metabolic imbalance. Um, so we decided to investigate whether the attrition caused by the exposure to the space environment could trigger these biological processes. And we hypothesized that these alterations could uh, all together uh, manifest as a frailty-like phenotype in us. And to do so, we focused on the muscle tissue, peripheral blood mononuclear cell, and uh, cell-free epigenome data. And the muscle tissue uh, is so far one of the most investigated tissue in frailty studies, and that this is why we gave up privileged focus to sarcopenia, which is a reduction in muscle mass and, and muscle mass and function and, and quality. Um, so this is uh, an overview of our project. Um, we work with, as I was saying, with muscle tissue uh, biopsies from mostly from NASA OSD data. We also have the JAXA astronaut study cell-free epigenome and the peripheral blood mononuclear cell inspiration for data. With these three data sets, 
um, we uh, investigated whether a frailty biomarker list that we derived from the literature um, had uh, this biomarker differentially expressed pre-flight, during flight, and after re-entry. And we also performed a uh, gene set enrichment analysis and metabolic flux simulation uh, based on historical chromic data to find signatures uh, related to aging, such as uh, biological pathways. And also, thanks to the contribution of Professor Casado's group, um, we curated a short gene list of predictors of sarcopenia that we obtained by analyzing a population of age-matched individual with and without sarcopenia, and we assessed their expression in our road and uh, open science data set mentioned before. We, we detected that multiple frailty biomarkers are differentially expressed during space flight, and also the novel sarcopenia-related biomarker that we identified, some of them are differentially expressed. So we postulated, we, we hypothesized that the, 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 the space environment can uh, uh, somehow influence a development, can uh, cause the development of a frailty like uh, condition in space. And since uh, even though our results are preliminary, uh, we um, uh, demonstrated the feasibility of this kind of study, and uh, we and also we showed the need for the investigation in the field. We submitted a paper that now is under review on Nature Communication Medicine, and as a future perspective, we want to integrate our transcriptomic pipeline to. Physical out to a physical phenotype to detect better pre detect frailty um, in space and develop a minimal panel of biomarkers to investigate. So, thanks everyone for your attention. And if you want to join us, just email me or Afshin. Wonderful, thank you, Andrea. Our next speaker in this series is Jonas Selsborg from Abzu, and he will be representing the multi-omics AWG. Go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thanks, Lavarka. Uh, not much time here, so uh, let's get going. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Jonas. I am come from the Danish uh, startup company called Abzu, where I work as a machine learning researcher. And this talk is titled Elucidating Dermatological Changes in Spaceflight with Explainable AI. So this sort of reveals that the approach we take here in Absu is based on the fact that we try to not only predict based on the data that we have, but we also want to try and explain the models that we find. So typical paradigm in, in AI is that you have this big black box, a tree model or a neural network with many different parameters. You shove in your data and then you get out some prediction, but it's typically quite hard to understand exactly what is going on. So instead in APSU, uh, we take the approach where we try to implicitly and inherently encode transparency into our models, uh, making them more creative and also simpler typically while retaining some robustness. Uh, and this also makes us able to uh, interpret them and get out some scientific knowledge. And this is basically why I'm here today because we took this approach also in a paper that is under review right now at Communications Medicine um, which is co-first authored by me and Henry Cope, who I believe is also present today. And as you can see, many, many familiar faces. Um, we investigated basically what changes uh, occur in, uh, in skin when you go to space based on transcriptomic data sets uh, from mice. We also included uh, some human data, but time constraints forced me to focus mostly on what we did with the mice uh, in this case. So why even talk about this skin problem? Well, uh, astronauts tend to have skin problems when they go to space. So it would be quite nice for them if we figured out a way to, to, uh, to handle that. And um, on the other hand, since, well, skin is our largest organ, it's like our outer layer, so to speak, uh, protecting us against um, any uh, external pathogens. So typically any pathology you see in the body, a lot of them will also be like, have reverberations in the skin, so to speak. 
um, we all know skin cancer, for example. Um, so there's a good example there. But on the other hand, from a more pragmatic uh, perspective, skin is easily accessed. It's easy to probe. You can take a sample quite non-invasively. It doesn't really hurt. And well, if we knew how to solve these skin issues, we probably wouldn't be having them when we go to space. So basically, this is understudied. Um, our data consists of normalized gene expressions from the from bulk RNA seq from the MHU2 JAXA mission and the Rodent Research 5 and 7 missions. So basically, you have thousands of genes, their expression, and then uh, spaceflight status, whether the mouse has gone to space or not. Um, in this paper, we took a, a kind of a different approach, did some method development specifically for it, because we noticed that a lot of the genes tend to cluster together compared to their sort of functional um, annotation and gene enrichment. So what we wanted to do was instead to characterize a gene based on what friends it have, so to speak. This uh, basically means that we take a gene and then we ask this proprietary algorithm we have to come up with uh, or nominate another gene that given that you have information about this first gene, what other gene would you most like to know something about as well to better predict the outcome? And we do this in a quite robust way such that we are quite sure that this specific interaction, this measure that we developed and is detailed in the paper um, is solely indicative of the, of the interaction between the genes. So basically what genes pair well together. Um, and when we when we draw this out, it's quite obvious that, well, also from this uh, visualization where every single edge corresponds to a mathematical model between the two that go towards the output, that some genes are much more central than others. Some have an insane amount of partners, basically a measure that we have of whether it's a good partner or not, um, compared to others. And this specific gene, Berg5, also known as Survivin, is the most frequent one but it is also the one that has the strongest synergy effect out of the thousands of models that went into creating this picture of the data. And I should say, by the way, that this data is of course a reduced set, which uh, Henry was um, uh, had a genius insight into how to do, which I don't probably hear. So the thing is that, well, this, this model that we find with Berg5 is basically, well, Berg5 is an apoptosis inhibitor and it pairs well with these proliferation genes and the model that comes out of this is basically a gene where we can see that the wild type round mice are in an apoptosis proliferation balance. And you can basically swap the partner gene for any of these proliferation and tumor progression genes. And um, this leads us to the conclusion that, well, space looks like it's a loss of cell homeostasis, at least in the skin. And these mice astronauts did not have this balance while the ground mice did. Thanks to Ashton and Henry. For, uh, for this paper. We did a final stretch here and thanks to Sylvain and Lauren for always inviting us to this. Uh, and on behalf of the whole company, thanks for inviting us today. Wonderful, thank you, Jonas. Um, our next speaker is Balag Balaga Aulanreju from Ohio University. And he'll be representing the plant AWG. Balaga, go ahead. Um, thank you so much. You can see my screen, right? Sure can. All right. So I'm Balaga I'm from Dr. Sarah White Lab in Ohio University. And I'll be talking about our project, which is our daily needs and the proteomic response of Arabidopsis to the space flight environment and break hardware. Uh, the most comprehensive, I don't know. Is that is it rotating? Is it scrolling? Oh, I think no, we're no not way. seeing your advancing, you advancing the slide. Uh, it's, it's, it's glitching. Okay. All right. So the, um, the first and comprehensive transcriptomic and proteomic study done in space flight on Arabidopsis uh, by Cruz et al. in 2020, in year 2020, indicated low correlation between differentially expressed transcript and differentially abundant protein, which is an indication of the presence of post-transcriptional machinery and also pointing to the importance of proteomic study. The proteomic study can give insights which could not be seen from transcriptomic study. However, due to the inherent uh, challenge, 
of um, little mass, uh, tissue mass available for proteomic studies in space flight experiment. Only few proteomic studies on Arabidopsis has been conducted so far. The two proteomic study uh, which are indicated with arrow were conducted in our lab uh, by Cruz et al. in a brick PDFU where the plants are where, where they grew in the absence of light and in the absence of gravitational cue. And the, the other one conducted by Olari Wajo et al. Uh, at plants growing in the brick LED at where, where they grew in the presence of light while in space. Also, it is uh, important to note that there was a, a difference also in the seed line. Uh, the experiment conducted, the proteomic experiment conducted by Fell et al. in 2015 were on mutant, whereas the other three data sets were on Y-type Columbia Zero. So we did a, a meta-analysis of the uh, protein expression in the four adwares, and the intersect are the three proteins common to the uh, all uh, proteomic experiment. Uh, we have the microtubule destabilizing protein. We have a protein involved in defense response, and we have protein involved in mRNA binding. And also, um, excluding the ABRS, the experiments conducted in the ABRS being uh, a mutant seed line and comparing the three other adwares, which were the Y type, at the intercept lies eight uh, proteins. And th these are the eight proteins, and uh, a protein protein network interaction analysis of this eight protein reveal that central to this protein, uh, to the function of this protein is a regulation of microtubule polymerization and depolymerization, which is indicative of the fact that microtubule uh, polymerization and depolymerization is a major adaptation of plant to the space flight environment. Now, excluding uh, the limited our experiment to the two conducted in our lab, where we have one conducted in the brick LED, which had lights, which had, we had lights, and then the brick PDFU, where there was no light. Intersecting both of them at the intersect of these two experiments, definitely will be proteins that are abundant due to the space flight environmental stress condition, microgravity and um, ionizing radiation. Here, we, we have protein um, abundant due to photomorphogenesis, uh, cross-interacting protein, cross-interaction between light and uh, the space flight environment, and elusive protein due to advanced technology used during the proteomic analysis of the brick LED compared to the brick PDFU. And here we have protein that are involved in scotomorphogenesis, that is growth in dark and cross-interacting protein between darkness and the space flight environment. Now, bringing this intercept, which I call brick intercept, and comparing it to another experiment conducted in the European Modular Cultivation System aboard ISS, where we have 1G in space. That means where we remove the condition of microgravity. So at the intercept of both of them, we definitely be proteins that are, are abundant due to radiation, ionizing radiation in space flight, and due to fluid gas uh, mechanism alteration, which is not really um, important, as, which is not really important when dealing with plant as as at that. And here we have protein, proteins that are expressed majorly due to microgravity. And here, protein that are expressed majorly due to the European modular cultivation system hardware and cross interaction between the hardware and space flight. Now, conducting uh, a protein protein interaction on uh, the 14 proteins that are expressed uh, at the intercept, we have. Um, we see that majority of this protein are involved in ribosomal activity. And um, that is um, also taking note of the fact that some of them are involved in uh, regulation of uh, microtubule depolymerization. Now from this, it's obvious that uh, the target, one of the major targets of space flight ionizing radiation for Arabidopsis is the ribosomal activity. And so currently we co we comparing the transcriptomic data of our of the brick PDFU and the brick LED experiment, and also we will be proceeding to wet lab determination of the specific roles of this intersecting protein, and of course uh, we open to collaboration on proteomic meta analysis. And so um, I acknowledge Dr. Sarah White, Dr. Colin Cruz for their inputs during uh, this data analysis, and I also 
appreciate the NASA AWG Plant Omis Group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Balaga. Um, our next speaker in this section is, is Aidan Lewis from Colorado State University, and he will be representing the um, Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning AWG. Take it away, Aidan. Awesome, thank you all. I appreciate you all for coming to my talk today, Personalized Medicine for Martians. I, like many of you, really wanna to go to Mars, but space is really, really stressful for our body. Oh no, it's not advancing. Oh, there it goes. Oh yeah, it's lightning tiger, it's lightning bolt. All right, here's an overview of what we're going through today. Just gonna to do a little background on what space for AI medicine is about, the approaches in my research, some preliminary data, and then the future directions of my work. So let's get started with the background. Here's kind of the overarching goal of using AI for space health. Can we take a person here on earth, get some data from them, feed it to some AI ML, and then be able to predict how they're going to respond to long duration space missions and living on Mars. Obviously, this is a little bit of a problem because there's very limited data for astronauts in particular, and analogs are analogs at the end of the day. So we're, we're working right now on being able to make these models uh, count right now with some different data and then build on top of them. And here's just uh, that in a picture view. So right now I'm working with a rhesus monkey data set that I'll talk about in a second, using these, um, these health analogs to build some models that we can then incorporate further data, such as human data, to then further refine them and hone them to make really powerful predictions for uh, space flight and living on Mars. So what's the approach? Here's that monkey data set I'm talking about. This is about 275 monkeys housed at Wake Forest University. It is a public data set and they really want to share it with the world and they're going to come out with a package of papers delineating that. But what's unique about these monkeys is that some of them have been irradiated at different points in their lives um, and they have meticulous health records kept, monthly complete blood workups done, um, CT scans even. So these monkeys have just had the full uh, gamut of health data collected on them. So what I'm doing is I'm using cat boost gradient boosting models to see if we can do things like predict how the monkey's biomarkers change, uh, eventually looking at the central nervous system using some computer vision, um, how does it change uh, due to radiation? Can we cluster monkeys based on response? And then do things like predict health ailments like tumor genesis at the end of the day. Um, and there we go. Some preliminary data is, I predicted lymphocyte counts, which is pretty cool. So I chose lymphocyte percentages for these monkeys because it is a biomarker that's responsive to radiation and was one of the only biomarkers that actually showed some differences between the population of monkeys. And so what we're looking at here is on the y-axis, what the model predicted the lymphocyte percentages to be versus what the actual lymphocyte percentages are. Um, on the left is just doing this for one monkey. And then on the right is doing this for the full monkey cohorts. Um, this is 30%. So this was a 70-30 split. This is predicting the 30% here. And I will note that this is off of 10 iterations um, in learning. And we're getting R squares of uh, 0.9 and above. With two to four iterations, these are R squares of 0.8. So these are very sensitive models for this type of data, which is really impressive. Uh, you can do this with um, five different features. So what we're looking at is about 26 different features. Uh, you can do this with just irradiation data. You can do this for less monkeys. So even with 20 monkeys, this is still accurate. So really, really powerful stuff. Um, and the application being a diagnostic and risk mitigation tool for NASA. I'm not gonna show this as well, but you can also predict the occurrence of tumor genesis in these monkeys with high accuracy and uh, precision as well. So very, very exciting stuff. Cool, so future directions. What I wanna do is start incorporating this data in these models with other NASA data, such as the OSDR data, the standard measures data, 
and really make these really robust ensembles of models. Uh, also implementing NASA tools such as the causal inference platform, CRIS, and the impact tool that the XMC or um, yeah, XMC folks have developed as well for predicting um, the likelihood of different elements occurring in space. And so incorporating this, the, these powerful models into these other powerful models to make them even more powerful. That's why I like it. Uh, this is a very fast talk. So if this is interesting to you, please contact me. I love talking about this. My LinkedIn, but thank you so much to the Bailey Lab here at CSU. That's some Lauren Saunders. We're getting me involved here. Dr. Klein, who's at Wake Forest and who has the monkeys. Um, NASA, everyone who's believed in me. Appreciate it. Have a good one, y'all. Perfect timing, Aiden. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker in this category is uh, Matthias Nesset from McGill University, and he will be representing the Ames Life Sciences Data Archive AWG. Go ahead, Matthias. Okay, thank you, Lavorka. Second, as we get this going. All right. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to a lightning talk about my project, the citizen science approach for searching and curating literature on the effects of spaceflight on cardiovascular outcomes in rodents and humans. Spaceflight experiments are costly and rare, making the legacy data they acquire important for enriching data sets. Therefore, there's a significant need to find, curate, and incorporate legacy data into AI-ready databases such as NASA Ames Life Science Data Archive, or as I'm sure you all know, ALSDA. Previously, our lab curated legacy data on bone health and space travel using knowledge synthesis approaches, a paper from Fu et al. in 2021. This caught the eye of Ryan Scott, who then contacted my supervisor with the intention of uploading this literature-derived data into open databases. From this paper, we then selected five of the 40 articles used, which were NASA funded and already existed within NASA databases for curation into ALSDA. During our data curation and upload process, we ran into several different problems that required some problem solving and iterative efforts. I don't wanna to spend too much time here, but I just wanna outline that this table is just a small fraction of the obstacles and solutions we encountered during this time with the main one centering around the required configurations at the top uh, sorry, I'll just add my pointer uh, with the ones centered around the, the required configurations and having them available to be uploaded. Here, we have a short process flow diagram of the curation process. A high-end view shows that it's effectively split into a three-step process with assay configuration, data templates, and data curation, with reviews from various expo experts denoted by the stars along the way. Finally, a few weeks ago, I had received word that one of the studies that we had curated uh, fully cleared approval and was publicly released. Uh, that was very exciting for us. Um, and this can actually be found as it was previously known as GLDS 471, but now as OSD 471. And here's what it, part of it looks like. Now, extending this bone outcomes analysis, we know that spaceflight, the spaceflight environment causes significant changes in the structure and function of the cardiovascular system. Going back to what I mentioned earlier about the need to find, curate, and incorporate legacy data into open databases, regarding my project right now, we are currently in the finding stage. Consequently, our overall goal is to find, extract, and analyze all the recorded data for cardiovascular outcomes in spaceflight and simulated microgravity. To do this, we took a multi-step citizen science approach. We started by approaching NASA ALSDA Analysis Working Group investigators, where we held three meetings with 25 investigators and developed a list of relevant terms. These terms were then transferred to librarians who executed a search strategy in Medline, CINHL, Embase, and, and NASA repositories, yielding just under 19,000 articles. In parallel, we decided to recruit students and young professionals from space industry affiliated organizations. At recruitment close, we had approximately 100 individuals join from over 28 countries with a variety of high profile educational backgrounds. Finally, we offered all participants a virtual training course on the nature and methodologies of the project. Looking at actual screening progression, initially screeners worked at a decently slow rate of 5,000 articles per month. However, my supervisor and I then followed up with the top 20 screeners and gave them more tailored training, which increased their screening rate by 12 times to about 60,000 articles a month. And no, that is not a typo. Finally, these articles were then labeled into relevant categories. This PRISMA diagram shows our screening results. Of the approximate 19,000 articles we had, 
started with, uh, only about 3,500 will be going through to full text screening and resultant labeling. Now, touching on the labeling process, uh, the main groups of the labels are shown by the headers language, population, experimental methods, the simulated experimental methods, the focus of the article, and the study type. Additionally shown are each subgrouping of the articles and labels. Labeling results here show that the majority of the articles are actually in English, uh, done on humans, performed and simulated in actual spaceflight, spread out amongst simulated methods, while most of them focusing on cardiovascular outcomes and pr being primary studies. As outlined by the title of this project, we are focusing on large subgroups describing outcomes of actual and simulated space flights on humans and rodents, while also considering, considering some radiation effects. Uh, with, specifically with regards to radiation, we realize that there are some aspects that we missed in our initial search, and thus we will continue to be working closely with AWG members to redo this part of the project for more completion. We successfully showed that information science can reduce Informed citizen science can reduce screening time from months to weeks. Additionally, we recommend that investigators screen 10 to 20% of their library to better understand some topics that might require clarification. And finally, we showed that smaller individual work sessions drastically boost screener confidence and productivity. Looking at the future work, we want to do due diligence checks on the screening results by cross-checking the references of the reviews that we included and asking ALSGA experts to spot check articles they know should be included. We will complete the full text screening with the aid of our top 20 screeners. And after this, all of the uh, data extracted will be added into the ALSDA OSDR open database using methods similar to the bone data upload. Thank you for listening and thank you to all the collaborators who have helped. Thank you so much, Matthias. Um... Uh, thank you for your time and your presentation. And our last speaker in this section before we get to Q&A is Anna Simpson. She is from NASA, uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab and will be representing the microbes AWG. Go ahead, Anna. All right, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, let me so share my screen. Okay, can you see the full slide? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Anna Simpson. I am at Jet Propulsion Laboratory's uh, Planetary Protection Group, and I'm here to present on monitoring of ultra-low biomass JPL spacecraft assembly, assembly facility surfaces using novel surface sampling and nanopore sequencing. So more at the pointy end of data collection. Um, please advance, oh slide. I will ask you so nicely. There we go. Uh, so NASA planetary protection is uh, policy is that space hardware must be certified to a certain level of biological cleanliness, but right now the standard assay for certifying hardware selects specifically for bacterial endospores and takes 72 hours. So one, you're not catching your non-culturable microbes, and two, that's a really long time to wait with your delicate spacecraft instrument open and unable to move forward with putting your hardware together. So ideally, from both a planetary protection and an engineer's point of view, we would be able to sample, do rapid DNA extraction and sequencing, input the data into a risk assessment model, and within 24 hours or less of sampling, be able to say whether equipment needs to be re-sterilized or whether it can be certified for flight. And if you want to say commercial spacecraft company or space flight companies to follow planetary protection standards, whatever you ask them to do, it has to be easy and it has to be quick or they are not going to do it. Um, so, however, the gold standard Illumina library prep time and sequencing time is pretty prohibitive for rapid prep. And so nanopore sequencing is like the obvious choice here. It's light, it's portable, it's easy, but it's not designed for ultra low biomass samples. So we're going to need to do a lot of QC to make sure we're getting good quality data. And there is always the ever present issue when doing ultra low biomass work with background contamination from reagents, which in the case of human environments, Sometimes the very same microbes that are in your control reagents are in your samples. Um, so here I'm going to present us trying this out on the JPL spacecraft assembly facility floor, along with a new sampling instrument with much higher efficiency than swab or wipe and seeing what the kinks are. Um, so I'll quickly take you through the steps. So we took samples from the clean room floor using a newly developed sampling instrument called the SALSA, aka squeegee aspirator for large sampling area, which is patent pending and funded by a NASA SBIR grant from AI Biosciences. Its mode of sample collection should be pretty obvious here from this picture. You spray sterile water and collect it in the tube. And this sampling head here that you see is replaced uh, with a new one out of the package along with a new collection tube each time so that you're maintaining sterility. Uh, we sampled three locations in the clean room, two high traffic areas. So the A shower or AR in this figure, 
um, the entrance area of the clean room, ECR, and one low traffic area at the far end of the clean room. So we sampled three 12 by 12 inch adjacent areas in each spot and also took three process controls where we sprayed the same collection water that we were using on the floor into a sterile collection tube and sucked it up with a salsa instrument. So it was going through all the same processes that the control samples were. And so from there, we proceeded to sample concentration, DNA extraction with metapolyzyme followed by an automated magnetic bead pit designed for low biomass, library prep with uh, Nanopore's rapid PCR bar barcoding kit, which involves random amplification with long amp tack, bead cleanup and concentration with some alterations to use more DNA in the PCR step and pooling and concentration, concentrating the tag DNA before library prep and sequencing on an MK1C. And so we ran it for 24 hours just to see how much data we would get. But if we'd run this for three hours, we really would have been able to do this by the end of the day. Um, so this is probably the most important bit of results that we got out of this, which is here. So here we see the actual samples um, uh, on the, the right, the left side of the graph. So ECR, FCR, AR, and then we have the controls on the right side of these graphs. And so on the top left, we have the qubit of the original sample, uh, graph B, we have 16 sqPCR results. Uh, graph C, we have qubit after the long read amplification. This is the long amp tack. And then D, we have the number of nanopore past reads. And so interestingly, okay, in graph A, the qubit of the original sample, the DNA concentration, we're only getting DNA from the actual samples. Most of the samples, including the controls, are well below the limit of detection. Um, and then conventional qPCR, we are seeing amplification of the actual samples one to two orders of magnitude above the controls. Yay, not squeaky clean controls. There's still like five to 10 uh, sequences, 16S sequences in there, but it's okay. Um, so, but but after the long read amplification, only a few of the samples are actually amplified with the long amp tack. Um, so this is a problem. Uh, and so the, the, the samples that amplified after long amp tack were pretty much the same samples that um, got good nanopore data. So here you can see those those samples from the far side of the clean room are really the ones that we got good data from. Um, and we can see that the samples did that did amplify above the control samples have much higher proportions of bacterial and some insect reads. Um, in terms of the bacterial reads, just the bacterial reads looks better. Uh, so both at the genus and the species level, we are seeing that the true samples are dominated by Acinetobacter and Paracoccus species, whereas the control or kitome is dominated by Cutibacterium, Ralstonia, and Staphylococcus. And we are getting some good species level data that is very distinct from the controls. Now this was run on the old R9 flow cells, but with the new R10 flow cells from Nanopore, they're starting to hit the accuracy level of Lumina data. And so we could, could potentially put similar data to this one from those flow cells into a risk assessment model and have it not be garbage. Um, and so again, here you can see from the ordination and the per and in permanent was that those far side samples do cluster separately from the controls, but the ones that really didn't amplify well with the, the, the long amp tack are not. Um, and so there's so many issues to deal with with this protocol. Every piece of it's going to need to be QC'd um, because not only does, especially with the, the PCR step, because not only does it introduce a bias, in this case, the, this, the tack from our QPCR kit is working, but the long amp tack is not working. Um, and so if any people who are working on ultra low biomass stuff, come and talk to me, let's have a chat about nanopore sequencing. Um, and so we'd like to thank um, some of our collaborators, especially Scott Tai, who came and helped us with the nanopore sequencing and Lisa Guan for all her help um, and work on metagenomic standards for planetary protection. Right. That, and that is all. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna. Um, so if I can ask all of the speakers in this section to turn on your cameras um, so we can have a Q&A portion. All right. So the first question here is for Andrea. Andrea, uh, I have heard of epigenetic age. Do you plan to incorporate epigenetic data into your frailty assessment in future studies? Thanks for this question. And yes, this is what we plan to do. So we still have to define the data sets. So if you want to collaborate with us, we'd be very, very glad. We're really looking forward for this. So thank you. Great. And this is to all the um, 
AWG experts, all the speakers that have done sequencing, somebody asked this question, um, is every sample that is sequenced in space on the ISS or are samples gathered in space and then sequenced on Earth? And if so, how does gravity and other affecting factors impact the sample? I guess I could address that. Oh, there's someone coming in our lab. Um, so very relatively few samples have ever been sequenced on the ISS. Like, you know, they're, they have a nanopore sequencer up there, but um, mostly it's all, you know, sequenced on the ground unless someone has information that I do not. Um, so, I mean, someday in the future, maybe people's experiments, they can get their samples sequenced up there. I, I will say maybe not the gravity, but just like preserving the sample definitely affects in order to get it back down to earth definitely affects it. And that's no fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, somebody else have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. We also like in our study, we treat this also as a potential confounder because you sometimes work with live animal return and basic like this whole protocol of how the, the samples are frozen and whether, yeah, whether it's live animal return or not is can potentially confound the, the results depending on what mission it was, uh, it came from. So it's definitely something that is addressed, but no sequencing done in space as NSF. So. Yeah, for plant proteomics also, we try to freeze the proteomic, uh, the plant in um, like RNA later. Of course, uh, we had an experiment in our lab where they showed that RNA later definitely affect uh, the protein content and the protein expression pattern, but then is what we have currently and is what we do. So we, we freeze it about ISS in RNA later and it, it is returned frozen. Then we toy it here on heads and work on them. All right, thank you all. Um, we have a question here from Matthias. Um, what data do you foresee mined from the literature from your citizen science project? Um, so for right now, like I said, we were focusing particularly on the cardiovascular outcomes. However, one of the main goals of this project would be to develop a protocol along the way that would allow this to be transferable to any other sort of legacy data set. So this could be other uh, spaceflight data amongst that anyone wants to curate or uh, additional factors that we've been thinking of as well. So it can apply to other areas, like I said, of legacy, such as rare diseases. Um, you can even use this in natural disasters, again, where the data is low. Um, and so you can go over large data sets for many years in relatively shorter periods of time using the power of the citizen science. Awesome, thank you so much. I really wanna thank all the speakers in this category. Thank you for your time and your Fabulous presentations. I know five minutes is not easy to, to cover a lot of information, so thank you. Um, we do have to move on to our next category here, um, which will be status updates from our AWG leads. And um, the first speaker in this category is Nate Shevchik from Ohio University, and he will be talking about the animal AWG update. So give me a moment to share. While she's sharing, I'll just comment on that answer that Matthias gave, which is the other exciting thing about his project is it starts to move us towards evidence-based recommendations for future science. Because I think a lot of times we do things like have expert opinions rather than actually take a hard look at doing actual systematic reviews of data. All right, thank you, Lavorka. Um, in terms of an update, I have just one slide. So really this is gonna be a high level overview of kind of what's happened in the last year. I think Lauren did an excellent job kind of explaining what the guiding principles of the AWGs are. So I've broken down kind of the update into some categories, the first of which we'll call guiding gene lab or providing advice or trying to advance the AWG uh, agenda. And so really the, the main thing that we've done in the past year is work on closer collaborations with ALSDA. So Matthias just gave a nice talk about some of that and also with the multi-omics AWG. As part of this, we've ended up advocating for merging of gene lab and ALSDA analyses and 
potentially restructuring the AWGs. And so you've already heard from Lauren that NASA's decided to introduce the OSDR. Um, and so I think that's a very positive thing, at least from the animal AWGs perspective. We also currently have several papers under submission jointly with the multi-omics AWG. So you've heard about a couple of those already today. So Bedjan presented, uh, Andrea presented, and Jonas presented on some of those papers. And I'm sure there'll be a bit more about those um, briefly in the multi-omics update. Otherwise, one of the things that we like to think about the AWG is doing is helping our members. And so in that kind of category, it's really nice to say that two of our junior investigators were successful in getting Gene Lab analytics grants. Um, so they're both new investigators in their first academic post. So that's great. Um, and we've also had uh, some AWG members get a NASA grants round study funded this year. So again, that's great in terms of individual success. And I just want to reiterate uh, those comments that Sylvan made earlier this morning about how delightful it is to actually have had Elia as our keynote speaker. Um, obviously, she's come a long way from where she started in terms of starting to work with the AWG. Um, in terms of, I think, what most folks have been focused on in terms of the AWGs, though, is what I tend to call our work or our analysis. So before kind of talking about some of that, I would just want to point out that one of the other things that our AWG has done is we've actually tried to spin out other initiatives to support people so that we don't have to do everything just in the AWG. So for example, uh, there was an interest in actually doing single cell work, um, and we've now kind of tentatively agreed to spin that out into another analysis working group. First meetings have been held, and again, Amazingly, uh, that working group has actually got a grant from NASA to do some of this work. So we won't really be monitoring that anymore in terms of the animal AWG. Similarly, the International Space Omics um, group is continuing to work on protocols and publications. Website for them is there and available. Uh, so again, we are going to stop kind of monitoring that as a, as an AWG and let them continue as a great um, independent organization. Also, um, we've kind of monitored the ESA Space Omics topical team. That's been a bit more of an initiative across all of the four original uh, AWGs, where really this was about trying to get some funding for European researchers to participate in the AWGs, and it's been incredibly successful. Um, really, the group has elevated omics within ESA, so specifically, they've managed to get omics actually into the science strategy, so that's Roadmap 9E, and the link for that is there. The actual recommendations are currently being reviewed at Nature and Microgravity, so in theory, they will be fully open access and easily findable without having to have that specific link for ESA. I think for folks in this audience, there won't be any real surprises in terms of the recommendations. It's things like being able to link the omics to physiologic endpoints, being able to look for commonalities across tissues, being able to look for non-commonalities across tissues and species, and of course, actually trying to apply these sorts of techniques in real time. Um, so that kind of gets to the more AI, ML sort of side of things. Uh, Space Omics topical teams also had a special issue in cell press. There's currently 10 published papers there. Provide the link for you if you want to go over them. Really kind of talks about the history of doing omics in Europe, some individual projects and some recommendations for future directions. In terms of the actual kind of AWG work within the AWG at the moment, there are several projects in progress. Um, some of these are with old data, so US-based data um, in Gene Lab, And then we've got some new flight data sets, not all of which are in Gene Lab yet that we're working um, to start to analyze and get them deposited um, in Gene Lab. And so those will be ESA, UK, and JAXA data sets. And specifically for this year, one of our focuses, I think, is trying to work on increased collaboration with JAXA. Uh, and I'll just point out that, you know, they are one of the first space agencies to be putting um, astronaut data into Gene Lab. So they've just in the process of depositing a separate batch of that. And that's all I have for this year.
Thanks, Lorca. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so our next speaker in this category, our next um, co-lead is Daniela Bezdan. She is from the Univers University of Tübing Tübingen um, and she is representing the Microbes AWG. So go ahead and take it away. Hello, I'm, I'm sorry for the setting, I'm not sure, but um, we had problems with our internet in our lab and I'm now in the basement. So I hope you can hear me well. Sure can. Okay, the background is a little bit high, but I'm trying to make it short. So it'll be much shorter than I expect, uh, thing, but it's just like current situations. Okay. Um, just so we'll skip a couple of slides because it's very loud here here we go you can see my screen yes perfect okay so um again um thank you for um for this meeting as it was really great so far um i was able to follow it um so in 2003, like 2002, um, we gained more than, uh, now we are more than 100,000, uh, 100 plus members. And as a gene labs, um, we're looking forward to double it. Um, we have a lot of more interest, um, especially with the Inspiration4 um, and the, in the Axum station, there will be so many new microbes uh, experiments coming on. So we're really looking forward for new for new members and um, also um, we have the I4 and the YAXA paper package um, that's going. So it has been a very busy year. Um, I think that in the next two months, uh, we have much more to report. Um, I received a couple of slides for members of NASA GILET, but also slides which say, please not share it yet. So that's because they're not all accepted. Um, I think as many of you know, because you sent me the slides. Um, so in general, we currently what we're going to do, we're working on ongoing future manuscripts. Um, so of course the wife inspiration for the Jackson papers. Um, uh, this is a sentence on brain, too many to count, it's totally true. Um, we are still working on a road and research six uh, publication. It's really good in along. Thank you, Nick. Um, um, amazing effort here and to also work in a review the microbial waypoints on our pass to Mars. Something which we're really exciting, which is getting really, really big. So there's many, many stakeholders and um, at some point we think of writing a book, another review. Daniela, are you still with us? Okay. Uh, I think we lost Daniela, um, but perhaps we can move on to the next speaker and then um, when Daniela is able to rejoin, um, then maybe we can finish her presentation. Um, Marco, are we able to remove Daniela's screen share? Okay, perfect. Daniela, are you back? No, okay. Uh, so we're going to move on to the multi-omics AWG and um, Nathaniel uh, Shevchik from Ohio University will be giving um, this update as well. Um, so let me just pull up your slides. I hope I'm in back. Uh, 
All right, Nate, you can take it away. Thanks, Lavorka, and a special thanks to Ashwin for so kindly letting me um, give his presentation. Uh, just again, highlighting the fact that we've kind of moved towards um, being a bit more cooperative between a couple of the AWGs and, and trying to find some new ways of working. Um, so there's a picture of Ashvin on this particular slide. And the other thing I'll say is that you can see Ashvin's slides are much nicer than mine, which is the other reason that we like to work with his uh, AWG, because they do all kinds of cool visualizations. Next slide, please. All right. So much like I had a, a little bit of a thought about the way that I view my AWG, this is an example of how Ashvin tends to think about his AWG. And so I think really the key idea is that we try to integrate multiple data types to advance space biology. But he also has a, a really kind of defining feature of the group, which he's listed as the main goal here, which is to work as a large community of scientists on exciting and cutting edge space biology projects. And the nice thing about this particular approach is it lets every individual bring their unique um, skill set to the table. Next slide. Um, and so we've seen a, a kind of similar sort of graphic to this earlier for the introduction to the AWGs. And so this is an example of what Ashvin's put together for his AWG. I think the main things to kind of highlight here are that it is an international group. Um, and I did see that there was a question earlier about how nationality is tracked. And because this is NASA, we actually track nationality based upon the location of the organization that you happen to be located at, because that's how the export control rules work. Um, and on that note, if you look at the kind of logos of some of the organizations that you'll see involved here, there's a nice mix of academic groups, national organizations, and industry. Next slide, please. In terms of past work, I think there's kind of some general themes that we can see up in the left corner there is the cell paper that really focused on mitochondria as being a key hub of the response to space flight. We can see below that and to the right of it that there's kind of a look at actually trying to see what the impact of radiation both alone and in combination with other factors is on biological systems. And again, in terms of the usual suspects of things that people have worked on in the past, in the bottom left, we can see that the group's been looking at changes with muscle. But I think the really exciting thing about the group is that it's working in looking at new directions and new problems. So for example, earlier today, we heard from Bedjim about things to do with endocrine and female health. And we also heard from Jonas about using machine learning approaches. Next slide, please. To go into recent papers and things that are currently under review, I think it'll be really no surprise that there's a fair number of things that are using inspiration for data. So for example, we heard Bedjin present her paper that's under consideration at the moment on estrogen and insulin signaling pathway alterations across species and across tissues. Next slide, please. We also heard from Andrea about his exciting new concept of, we know that there are similarities between aging and spaceflight in terms of biological changes. And an emerging theme or idea within the aging community is, can we actually assess frailty and use that as a marker? So he started this very exciting initiative to see whether or not there are markers of frailty associated with spaceflight and whether that relationship between aging and spaceflight is conserved into this sort of concept. Next slide, please. We also heard earlier um, from Jonas, who talked a bit about a portion of this paper that's actually looking at skin changes. And we've also heard from some other folks about looking at skin today. Um, but I think for this particular paper, what I'd really like to highlight is what I find super exciting about this project as shown in red. This actually has a fair number of gene lab for high school participants who have actually participated in co-authoring and co-creating this particular paper. Next slide, please. We also heard earlier today from Andreas about trying to look at similarities between sarcopenia and space flight and trying to think about, can we apply things from the clinic on earth 
to trying to solve problems in space. Next slide, please. And then, of course, at the beginning, um, we had our keynote speaker, Elia, talking about the fact that we've entered this commercial space flight and commercial space flight participant age. And so one of the things that the AWG has been doing, which is similar to what Trish has been doing and what's similar to some of our international partners are doing, is starting to think about the ethics and also the operations of how do you actually think about doing experiments um, with private astronauts effectively. Next slide, please. We heard earlier about the idea of there being an epigenetic age. Um, and so again, it shouldn't come as any real surprise that the group is starting to look at epigenetic changes or structural changes to the DNA with radiation. Um, and so this is a particularly exciting area because I think a lot of times people don't realize that we can actually look at the structural DNA data and actually look at chromosomal regions to, to actually think about why mechanistically we're getting these changes in transcripts that we are. Next slide, please. Again, continuing on the theme with focusing on female health. It's also got another article with some consideration. Next slide, please. And again, in terms of other types of data sets, group's been looking at microRNAs and how DNA damage or other types of damage induced by radiation may be modulated uh, or may modulate microRNA expression. Next slide. And lastly, in terms of papers that we just wanted to highlight from the group, um, the group's also worked into starting to look at cardiac health, which again is a fairly exciting thing because we know there are changes in the cardiovascular system. We've heard a little bit about that, and we know that there are changes to muscle. So it's nice to start to be able to expand this to cardiac muscle. Next slide, which is the last slide. There are many future projects just thrown three of them up on this particular slide. One is kind of keeping with the theme of studying mitochondria and looking at what goes on with mitochondria across different tissues within one organism and across species. Also continuing with the frailty project that Andreas presented and continuing with the endocrine and the female health theme. But I think the really exciting thing here is that this group is ready to work on new things. They're a great group. They're a really collaborative group. And so really, if you're looking and joining one of the AWGs and you've got an idea, but you don't necessarily know how to make it happen, this is a great group to come join and really kind of get you on your way. You can see from all the papers that are currently out, very productive, very supportive group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nate. Appreciate that. Um, so sounds like we have Daniela back on. So um, Daniela, if you are able to hear me and able to share, why don't you go ahead and give it a try again? Um, Marco, can you give Daniela permission to share, please? She's a co-host, so she should have permission. Oh, now it's oh. working. Um, okay, I will share the screen, but I'm not switching on the camera. I'm so sorry. The, whole, the maintenance is here in the cellar. We try to fix it, but looks like the whole institute is out of Wi-Fi. <laughs> sorry, it's super unexpected, not, not planned. Okay, I try again. Bear with me, trying. Okay, so I will skip a couple of slides. So ongoing future manuscripts, we did some mainstorming and uh, we have exciting projects. So in a moment, the inspiration for and the uh, YAXA papers are out. We will look to, want to concentrate more on Mac contamination. We want to work on DNA alignment scales when the genomes needs a better tester. 
a viral flow genetic pipelines need beta testers. So if one of these topics are speaking to you, please um, join Microbes Lab and uh, we want to explore in that direction. Also, um, there's a couple of things which Brain asked me to share. Um, they're calling for a microbiologist for working with um, carbon capture applications. This is something we're going to investigate as a group as well. And the other one at camp is um, new metagenomic, um, it was a meta sub, um, um, GitHub camp got an update for the assemblies. This is always going to investigate it. And um, I think, sorry. Okay, it's it's hanging. I think I'm not sure if you can see the slides anymore. We can see slide RR6 fecal taxonomic whole genome sequencing. No, no, it's hanging. I'm already I'm already in the next slide. Okay, Laborga, let's let's give it here. Um, these are like now. Um, I think this, this these are um, experiment from Nick and from Gilmore, but. That's about this. Let's let me share the slides and uh, by email, and we fix the problem. And um, let's use the one time because I don't think it's not moving. It's not moving okay. on my side. I'm so All sorry. right. Thank you for trying. I appreciate it. All right. So our next speaker um, will be Christina Johnson. She is from NASA Ames Research Center, and she'll be um, speaking on behalf of the plant AWG. So, Christina, if you are on, um, can Hello, I please? I am here. I hope Hi. it's working. Can you hear me? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Perfect. Let's share, <laughs> and hopefully everything will go well. Um, oh, of course, I need to press the share screen button first. Imagine that. Sorry about that. Okay, is this showing my slides? Sure is. Perfect, okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Christina and I'm part of the Plant AWG and I'm going to be sharing with you the progress of plant-based biology omics to date. This was put together by me, Kristen Peach, Colin Cruz and Richard Barker. So uh, here's a picture of some of our plant AWG members. There are 84 of us, so that not everyone could fit on the slide, but it's a really great international team doing great work. So we have about two meetings per month. Sometimes we have uh, a fewer um, because of um, various reasons, holidays or symposia or whatever. But uh, one of these meetings has group updates, a focus on announcements and some big overarching things that all happens on teams. And then we have a Zoom meeting at a different time um, once a month where we have breakout sessions with focus groups on specific projects. So over this past year from March through March, we've had 20 meetings um, and we had, um, not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but we had uh, 12 of these meetings had 10 to 13 attendees. Six of these meetings had 14 to 19 attendees, and two of these meetings only had six to nine attendees. So that's actually really good attendance for the plant biology world. Not sure about the other AWGs, but we're really happy with those numbers. Um, in general, we tend to have about 12 participants per meeting. The smallest was six, and the largest was 19. So we noticed that there are higher attendance uh, during academic breaks, and so that's something to keep in mind in the future. Um, an average AWG member attends three meetings over the course of the year. And that's because a lot of our work is done asynchronously. Um, so just sharing a few recent gene lab enabled plant publications. This was published by Ariel Hughes and John Kiss. Um, this covers really great omics studies of plant biology and space flight. So it had a, a bunch of these recent studies that they just put together and reviewed and really showed off the hardware with great graphics, great publication. And then also Alexander Myers and Sarah Wyatt put together this plant space biology in the genomics age, which is a really great uh, review plus future insights about what we need to do in the future. So really great papers, highly recommend you read them. But then there's this one <laughs> that we've been working on for 
two years now, I think it is, a meta-analysis of the space flight and microgravity response of the Arabidopsis plant tr transcriptome. And this is the one that we've been working on as the AWG together, spending a lot of time, it has a lot of authors, um, and it's in proofing stages. And we we're really hoping to be able to share a link today, but not quite yet. Um, hopefully in the next week or two, I don't want to jinx it. Um, so uh, we also worked on the white papers uh, and submitted a bunch of white papers. Uh, we worked together on one, this research campaign, space biology reference experiment campaigns for high fidelity plant physiology. And then we also had um, a lot of contributions by AWG members. So there were three contributions um, three of these papers were contributed by AWG members that were related to plants in space. And then there were two white papers submitted on topics related to the AWG mission that um, a plant AWG members participated with. And this was Omics and Open Science, a platform and approach for the future for space biology. And also one about uh, including disabled population uh, with uh, inclusion efforts. So uh, next steps in the support of space exploration. So we already have 62 plant data sets from six different species in the openscience.archives. That's a lot <laughs> compared with the past. We're gonna be growing so much more. These are just uh, imaging lab repository, but we are now looking at uh, how the OSDR is accepting non-omics plant data. This is huge. This is going to change things. We're going to be able to, to start looking at uh, plant phenotypes. We're going to start looking at the morphology and development of plants in relation to that um, omics information that we've already been collecting. So this is a very exciting shift and I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, keeping in mind, the decadal survey is going to be coming out this summer. And so we're all looking forward to seeing what they took from the white papers we wrote and what, what are going to be prioritized for the next 10 years. And we're going to be working with that. So also I went back and I looked at um, Plan AWD membership overall and activity in the last year. And um, we have 86 participants in the Plant AWG, 47 didn't attend any virtual meetings this year, but many of those contributed to papers. Some of them viewed our recordings of the meetings and every one of them that I contacted are all enthusiastically available to the Plant AWG as subject matter experts. And they're just waiting for us to reach out to them and ask them questions and welcome their participation. So while they may not have the time to attend the meetings, they're contributing to publications, they're, they're making an impact in our group. And I see that as untapped potential. And it's a really exciting. Um, 38 of our members did attend at least one meeting. So this is, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, the larger chunk here that's in gray was the 47 that attended no virtual meetings. And then this little green part is the 38 that attended at least one meeting. And this is a breakdown of those 38. So we had five people who went to more than 15 meetings. I am so impressed <laughs> with the people who could go to that many meetings and made time for that. They have been the backbone of our group. So 13 of these folks went to five to 14 meetings. And then 20 went to one to four meetings. And even having them at one meeting makes a huge difference, especially if they attend one of those meetings where we're having the breakout session. It's really great how they're participating and, and being a part of things. So I think moving forward, we're really going to be working on engaging with the Plant AWG in a way that they need to be engaged with. Inviting labs to give scheduled periodic updates during AWG meetings will be a way to get kind of a, hey, what's going on with the Wyatt lab? Oh, hey, what's going on with the Mars lab? What's going on with, with the KISS lab? Let's, let's hear all of these great things. Welcome teams to sh that are, we're going to start seeing teams that are sharing non-omics data and we need to welcome them with our open arms, whether that's at the plant AWG or a separate um, ALSDA AWG that's focused on plants. Somehow we're going to have to welcome them and incorporate them in, into the discussion because there is going to be a lot of crossover with our work. Uh, we'll want to advertise breakout sessions in advance. A lot of times we had breakout sessions uh, this past year where it was like, oh, 
We don't quite have the people we expected. Oh, we forgot to reach out to them. We better do that better this time. Um, and also something that came up was having a, a writing club meeting twice a year where we could get together with our current manuscripts, look at them as a group, seeing, seeing what contributions people have to, to bring to those. Uh, just getting another set of eyes makes such a big difference. Um, another thing we noticed as we were looking at our, our email list, some of these emails aren't current anymore. We've lost track of certain people. So we need to go find them and, and make sure that they want to be a part of the EWG still and make sure that their emails are current. And also something I'd really like to do is ask present and past members how they want to improve the EWG, how they want to personally engage with the AWG. And I think that will make a big difference to improving our productivity. And that's it. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Christina. And um, our next speaker in this category is Ryan Scott and he's from NASA Ames Research Center. And he is the um, AWG lead for the Ames Life Sciences Data Archive AWG. Go ahead, Ryan. Great, thanks. Uh, I believe the screen is sharing, correct? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Cool. Thank you. Um, gosh, Christine, I really liked how you did a breakdown of the AWG membership and meetings and attendance and how to go back to previous AWG members. And um, it speaks very closely to what the ALSDA AWG has been going through. So our, the AW, ALSDA AWG started in the summer of 21, if I remember correctly. And uh, it's been an interesting journey, so I'll go over that. And just to, just to start off with the snapshot of the various members, uh, just a portion of the kudos of AWG members. Um, but yeah, one thing we are finding is, depending on people's expertise and their area of interest and subjects, uh, it, there's, it's, a, it's an ebb and flow. Uh, I usually figure we have a, there's a generally, when we have an AWG meeting, we haven't had one for the last couple of months for the ALSDA but it's because we've been having several meetings a month of uh, subgroups and we, we decided not to like, well, we can, we should talk about this more. I just really enjoyed your, 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 your thoughts, Christina, on what to consider. So for, so in terms of just the ASDA overview and sort of the big picture, when you think of gene lab, you think of the molecular omics data, transcriptomics, uh, GWAS, uh, proteomics, metabolomics, epi, uh, transcriptomics, uh, that, that type of thing. But what about the rest of the data? And so this is one of the things that we think of, and which is one of the reasons ALSDA and uh, uh, Gene Lab had the integration starting, uh, uh, where I guess it would be summer of 21, right? So that animal data, this could be rodent, it could be fruit fly, C. elegans, uh, a number of different assays. So it could be behavioral assays, it could be tenometry, it could be Western blot, it could be spectrophorometry, it could be MRI, it could be ultrasound, of course, microscopy, uh, plant data, all the way from the images to, that's why I was so keenly listening to Stephen's talk on this hyperspectral imaging, but also photos, or maybe you have the soil uh, and uh, growth uh, nutrient uh, uh, profiles. Of course, human data, as human data comes into OSDR, we, we are having standards for those data, of course, as well. And this could be is starting with the inspiration four for non-omics data, we are looking at uh, cytokine panels, comprehensive metabolic panels, and complete blood cell counts, but also having the type of um, uh, 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 data on the um, uh, on the human data set, so that those also can be made uh, reproducible and findable, and have a good uh, that, that type of thing. But also thinking about microbial data yeast, algae, especially with the, like the recent BioSentinel mission that was deployed on, uh, on uh, I almost said Apollo, uh, Artemis. And so when I think of all these types of data going being part of ALSDA, you can think of these as any of the tabular, the text, the imaging, the video, or the code, always striving to not just have the tabular results that you probably put in a pub, but also the raw data. That's going to be the sort of the, the striving gold standard that we want to go for so that you know, if there's questions on the histology or questions on the Western blot or questions on the imagery, you can always go back and look at the the, the, the actual raw bio, bioimaging or whatever level of data it came from. And in, and in terms of, and beyond the scientific data, also the telemetry. So 
Uh, I know at the beginning of today's today's event, uh, Lauren did mention the uh, environmental data application, uh, but which right now is largely focused on helping, uh, well, on shining a light to the telemetry related to rodent research. But we do have plans to. I know there are plans to extend that. So, um, so just a recap on what what is OSDR. It's really the combination, including these three different. Uh, groupings forming the OSDR, which now has the single submission portal. We have the user interface. Uh, data are maximally open access, although there are necessary controls for sensitive data, and data are maximally fair. And so what, what is the ALSD AWG been largely focused on? Um, because this is a new chapter of data types that we're curating, make, making available to the public, the AWG has played an unbelievable critical role helping to standardize the ingress of data as well as, well as helping us standardize the egress of data outside of OSDR. And so, uh, for example, in the submission portal right now, these are initial versions. If you've gone in there and tried to play around with these, they are initial versions of different types of assay metadata. So these are, these are aspects and parameters about the device, about the reagents you used in the assay, the settings of a microscope or maybe aspects of a behavioral like it could be like a behavioral rodent uh, uh, test right and so this is what largely the AWG has been helping provide feedback on are these scientific uh, uh, standards so that, that that when the data gets released there it's it's you can really have confidence in the science acumen of the data so a really really great spin-off activity uh, um, that Matthias just printed, presented on a little while ago is that Solstice uh, Citizen Science Project, um, which uh, presented a poster at HRP IWS, as well as two posters at the recent Canadian Space Health uh, Research Symposium, as well as three grants have been submitted uh, to NASA and the Canadian Space Agency uh, to make that Citizen Science Project more official. Um, and of note, uh, here are uh, several current uh, data sets that are now live on OSDR that came through uh, this this uh, pipeline of curation and, and data collection via the uh, uh, which, which was connected to the ALSD AWG. So one other thing the ALSD AWG has been providing feedback on is in the coming year, there are plans in OSDR to expand the architecture to really focusing on bioimaging and video data to make these maximally open access and re reusable. So, you know, we, we have the investigation sample and assay, you know, and sample metadata pretty, pretty soundly covered uh, within the repository. Uh, but one of the things that needs to be expanded are the assay and modality uh, metadata so that they can then also have file and format conversions when these types of, it could be microscopes or photography or it could be MRI or it could be CT scans. Um, uh, having file format uh, conversions. It does seem that bioformats, which is a, a, a actually just an image J plugin uh, that we we're, we're closely, we've developed a relationship with the open microscopy environment that developed the bioformats tool. So looking at that, uh, and then also thinking about the data itself on the imaging side, so that raw, but also you could have annotated data or you could have segmented data. Uh, and so different levels of process data, how to handle those, to make them also findable and uniquely available through the API, but also for the public and for the, your own reusage, because there's this amazing renaissance that's occurring in the bioimaging world. Uh, so we, we also don't want to have to have people download a terabyte of, of image data if they want to go look at a microscopy data set. So figuring out a different data visualization tools and also ways to chunk the data rather than having to have do the direct downloading and for visualization. And so this is one of the other activities the AWG has been involved in, spanning from Jackson Labs to uh, Quarup Lemmy, Bioimaging North America, European Bioinformatics has their own uh, image archive called the Bioimage Archive, which is great. And in a pretty similar boat to where we hope to be within the next coming year, so um, which only focuses on images. So uh, that's another aspect of what's coming up in the future. Um, was this this past year? Yeah, yeah, just last year, right? Uh, the, we had the first uh, ALSDA AWG publication, which is excellent. Um, the, uh, the Human Systems Risk Board, uh, centered around NASA uh, Johnson Space Center, recently released a series of what they call directed acyclical graphs, 
which are trying to take evidence-based data and 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 and, and graphs so nodes and edges were produced into these 36 or 37 uh, unique uh, directed cyclical acyc acyclic graphs and uh, they sort of now that they had all these SMEs produce these graphs and so what they wanted was to actually begin to validate them with with actual data and so several different bone data sets that were in OSDR that are currently either available or being released. Uh, two of them are, are available, two, two more are about to be available, uh, were, were, were shared and then put out for this publication as a proof of concept on ways to validate the DAGs, um, which can be used for eventual risk quantification for astronaut health and, and individualized risk quantification. If anyone has those links, it'd be great for someone to put those. I see Rob's here, so if any, it'd be great if someone could share those links in the chat. Uh, another uh, AWG collaboration was what Val Fajardo uh, pointed to was, and also which ties to Abzu, which I know Jonas was mentioning, is the explain all the AI uh, activity on muscle loss. Uh, after Val submitted the RR9 calcium uptake spectrophorometry data, there were already RR9 data and R1 data in, of course, from GeneLab. And so it was a really nice, nice exercise to be able to integrate those data and then have new results that have real biological implications. So those are the data sets connected to there. And I don't know if Henry Cope is still still around, but another thing I'd like to think is an AWG activity is having uh, developing a pipeline with the computer vision uh, model tools and transforming transformer tools. Uh, because now that we have the omics data from GeneLab and the non-omics physiological data and imaging data, you know, we, we have an ability to use some of these more machine learning tool models in an image proce processing pipeline uh, for then someone from the public could go select these imaging tools front and then look at the data, select an imaging tool, and then merge the data for even higher level uh, analytics. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it was a pleasure to be able to collaborate with Henry uh, recently on that. Um, I did want, I'm not going to go over these in great detail. Um, uh, but just to give you a sense of what goes into these assay metadata configurations and the entire sort of overview and workflow. Like, so this is to make all of these various assay configs, we call them for short, that we do have a process established and it's, 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 it's just took a phenomenal amount of effort and feedback and revisions and, and sub meetings and breakout sessions and uh, but we also, for the results itself, to have confidence in the tabular results, because right now every data set that comes from us from a PI, the tabular results, every single data set is individually unique. You know, these data don't come to us standardized like raw sequence counts or even process data. Any, any, you know, a lot of these are just data sets that come that are in Excel or CSV format that were used for a publication. So we, we're, we've come up with these data uh, templates uh, and and standards for the results data, which we're working on. And then lastly, we do have our the ALSDA curation and public release pipeline that leads bef to before we actually release a data set. So it's one of the things that the AWG has really pr pr uh, played a key role in providing feedback for. So um, I won't go into too much detail, but I thought it would be worth mentioning walking through through one config. Um, this is for the elevated plus maze assay. This is a rodent uh, assay. Uh, um, and so just to give you a sense of you know, after a series of meetings and asynchronous edits on a shared Google Doc, we then had a few different breakout sessions within the AWG monthly meeting for ALSDA. And then that December 2021 is when there was a final consensus. Like, you know, let's let this is a good EPM elevated plus maze assay. And this involved ontology selection and sort of sort of always trying to have gold standard literature drive the decision making. Uh, but then like having to think about the arrangement of the assay, of this beh especially behavioral compared to other different assays, the arena, the objects, the various different characteristics or structure sizes and, and, and specs uh, to other different characteristics about how the assay was performed. I will keep, I will encourage you to just remember that arena and objects for a moment, like the shape of the arena or the size of the arms, because I'm going to show it you to uh, show it to you again in a second. Of course, then you have the testing environment and this was big scientific implement implications if you don't have the metadata, for example, on even the cleaning solution of the platform that you used for that animal, that can throw off the results of that of that, of that behavioral assay because of the role of olfactory uh, being so dominant for, for rodents. So, um, and then here's an example of that uh, standardized uh, template. And then uh, just like I said, to remember that 
that example of a uh, for the um, arena and objects. This is an example of about to be released data set, uh, which is using that elevated plus mat elevated plus ma uh, elevated plus maze assay. And uh, like here's the here's the overview, uh, the various factors. Uh, we have the various protocols that were part of this study. Uh, here's the sample table, which a lot of people probably recognize if you've perused OSDR before. And here's an example of that EPM assay config in practice. Here's the arena description, and you can actually see what's the textured materials. You know, what's the size of the arms, the dimensions, what was the shape of the arena, right? So you can sort of see why we had to ask the SMEs, what do you need to have to make this data is the minimal, absolutely necessary information. And now you can sort of see what it looks like in practice. So, um, uh, and then actually the data itself, thinking about the template, this is an example of the types of tabular data that we get. And then what we do is we transform it so that there's one single tab, it's, it's out of Excel, it's in a CSV, so it's easily exportable. And it might sound simple, and this is really important, all of the samples are in a row, whereas all of the parameters that you've measured are in a column with maximum, with, and we have an AWG standardized nomenclature on top of it. And this is really important for future PIs that submit their data to always strive to have your data in this type of format for all samples in a row and all columns in a uh, in the parameter as, as a parameter. So um, there might have been a little, I just probably should have mentioned this earlier in the day, but people might be wondering about the numbering structure that's currently going on in OSDR because we have our new OSDR numbers. So um, uh, this is just a snapshot of what all that means. So um, yeah, once again, thanks to all the AWG members and oh, I appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was a great overview of the ALSDA. And we have our final speaker of the event. We are coming full circle back with Lauren Sanders, um, who is at NASA Ames Research Center, and she will be talking about the artificial intelligence machine learning AWG. Take it away, Lauren. Uh, Lauren, are you speaking? We cannot hear you. Still cannot hear you. Okay, I think we're gonna give her a moment to come back. I think she left and uh, we'll rejoin momentarily. If you have any questions for Ryan, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or, um, or on conference IO. There we go. We can hear you, welcome back. Thank you, I don't know what happened. You could hear me this morning. <laughs> All right, uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Hey, thank you everyone who has uh, stayed with us to the end of the day today. I'm going to be providing the update for the newest AWG, the AIML AWG, um, on behalf of myself and my co-lead, Dr. Jaden Hastings. So when we started the AIML AWG, we held a working session to develop four main focus areas for our group for the next one to three years. Um, these are aspects of AIML and space biology research that the community and the scientists in our group felt were the most important for short-term progress. So the first focus area was we want to work on enhancing the AI readiness of the data and metadata in the uh, Open Science Data Repository, or OSDR. Um, this work is going to focus on generating guidelines for standardized AI-ready data set structures for the data system. The second focus area is we would like to work on developing algorithms specifically that will work with the constraints and challenges that we face in space biology research. 
So this area is going to focus on uh, gaps in current capabilities and developing benchmarking tasks for new algorithms that are developed. The third focus area um, has an emphasis on self-driving labs, which are these um, automated closed loop AI enabled experimental platforms. So we're here going to prioritize um, physiological biological questions for automation um, and work on integrating multiple automated experimental platforms and um, getting comprehensive experimental readout. And our goals um, are to help develop the capacity for in situ analysis, so on a spacecraft or on a CubeSat, um, and active learning, so an AI system that can uh, react to um, input. And the fourth focus area um, is for supporting trust, ethics, and explainability for AI and space biology. So it's particularly important to us to help train the new generation of AI investigators to conduct ethical experiments and to help establish consensus and expectations for ethical research standards for the use of AI ML in space biology. So the membership of our AWG has a variety of priorities and goals, um, including 65% interested in gaining skills and knowledge sharing for research, almost 25% wanting to learn more about the data that's available through OSDR, and then additional groups who are interested in networking for career development and publishing scientific papers. We currently have two active subgroups in our AWG. So one of these is on self-driving lab technology led by Dr. Adrian Horfast, and one on research and writing, which is led by Dr. Jaden Hastings. The subgroup on self-driving labs will have its first meeting next week. So I will just review the goals of this group at today's update. We envision a cycle in which we train a model on labeled training data, we then use an acquisition function to design sample selection and an experiment from an unbiased design space. Automated human in the loop testing of the target outcome and then adding new labeled examples to that original training data and the cycle then continues. The motivation for this work is to increase sample number through enabling higher throughput experimentation in space increase repeatability and re reproducibility via automated processes and uh, free up human time. Now uh, to switch gears and give an update on the other subgroup on research and writing, the motivations for joining this group are diverse from wanting to engage in brainstorming and discussion to being interested in collaboration and writing papers and proposals. The core philosophy of this subgroup um, is to enhance capacity and collaboration, provide a dedicated time for people to get together and advance specific projects, identify existing knowledge and gaps, and support all of our group members um, through professional development. The current topics being explored and written about in this subgroup are compute power um, in orbit and beyond, next generation biocomputing, space medicine automation and ethical challenges um, for AI um, in space biology. And as a group, we're currently working on at least two review papers, one of which is focused on ethics and one of which will focus on computing in space. So as a group, we're very excited about the opportunities ahead of us and we would love to invite your participation. Please feel free to reach out to me via email um, or sign up for our AWG using the sign up form in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, and this was our last presentation and concludes the 2023 Analysis Working Group Symposium. Again, I want to give a big shout out and a big thank you to all of our speakers for putting in the time um, to put together these presentations and share their work. I want to thank Blue Marble Space for their sponsorship and providing this platform, as well as Marco for helping us um, deal with all the technical challenges um, during this event and also all of the participants. We thank you for joining us. Uh, we thank you for listening. And again, if you are interested in joining, fill out that sign up, uh, sign up form. Um, the AWGs would love to have you. So with that, thank you all. And until next time, goodbye, everyone.